if we look at kind of 25 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, Western companies, whether American companies or European companies, yeah. kind of moving into Asia, being market leaders in yeah. whatever industries they were in and sort of well positioned mm -hmm. to, uh, to grow in this landscape. Has it now shifted, I mean, is it a disadvantage to be a large Western company in Asia? I mean, is it easier, uh, even if you're much smaller, mm -hmm. to be used to operating in sort of the Asian environment? Uh, and so we'll see more investment into local companies and more of the growth accrue mm -hmm. to those local companies. It's definitely both. Remember that there is still a brand and quality premium in mm -hmm. many sectors. You know, so if, to take the uh, kind of archetypical example is, let's say, German machine tools sure. and industrial companies, right? They're second to none still. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to do very well here. If you look now at utilities, um, Italian companies like NL, you know, or even you, you Germans again, like Siemens, they're first rate, right? So they, they still, cost price is a very important factor here, obviously. So they, I've witnessed now, you know, 10, 10 plus years of Western firms that have come in and wanted to do big systemic kinds of infrastructural projects but they couldn't quite get the price down to where it needs to be for Asia. So there's an adjustment process there. But they're also increasingly buying right, local firms and helping to upskill them and use their resources. And that's all part of what the new trade and investment frameworks you know, sort, of, sort of encourage. So it's both. But I think there is still a, a quality premium. Again, then there's also the aspirational effect. You're, you know, here in Singapore and in other countries in the region, you know, young, talented software programmers do want to work for Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so forth. You know, it's so funny that the brand of big tech in America has suffered immensely, but it's enormously powerful and positive still yeah. in, in much of Asia. So that's also less controversial. So I would say it really depends on, on, on the company, on the sector, on the country of operation. But that's all part of being such a huge economic area that Asia is. You're going to see all of those things at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so some of those aspirational sort of tastes or ideals, um, they're obviously shifting, as you sort of chat about in the book, from aspiring to buy a Western brand mm -hmm. to really aspiring to buy a quality local right. brand. If you can also sort of talk us through how that, the catalyst for some of that, mm -hmm. uh, and, and where we are I mean, right. in that, the pace yeah. that that's yeah. increasing. You know, in some areas it isn't new, right? There is something of an indirect line from, say, Sony in the 50s and 60s to Huawei and Samsung today. I mean, you know, Asians, the young millennial Asians that I know, um, you know, wouldn't literally, I mean, you know, uh, Chatham House rules, even though it's not, they wouldn't be caught dead with an iPhone. They're like, you use an iPhone? Come on, look at the latest Samsung Huawei. Look at, look at how many pixels my camera is you know, versus yours. So there is that in electronics for sure. You're seeing it with fashion uh, in uh, kind of lifestyle brands, hospitality, you know, F&B and so forth. So remember that these are consumer societies, right? We, a lot of, it's very important for people to come to Asia and spend time here and realize that when you're talking about the new generation of Asians, they're not aspiring to work in factories and make cars and widgets to export to the West, yeah. right? And I've documented this clearly. The economic composition, primary, secondary, tertiary, agriculture, manufacturing, and services, mm -hmm. is very similar in poor Asian countries than in, as in Western countries. We're talking about 50 to 80% of GDP that is in services. So even a place like Vietnam, where you've got all the net new manufacturing work coming in, and it's a poor country, it's still better than 50% services, which means that young Vietnamese are like young Westerners. They get up in the morning, they drink a cup of coffee, they get on a scooter or a moped, and they, they go to an office and they do services work. Yep. It's just a lower per capita income. So we really have to think about, especially the next generation globally, as being very, very similar because the, the, the manual labor, that is, is being automated to a large degree. So the manufacturing wave that Asia is experiencing now is not going to employ nearly as many people as it did in the 70s, you know, and so on. But they don't need that because they are services economies like us. Mm -hmm. And is that starting to, to move outside of Asia as well? I mean, Europeans or Westerners kind of 
craving or aspiring to buy some Asian brands that have been, I mean, I'm just, if I look most recently, obviously at Squid Game, yeah. which is consuming content yeah. from, from Korea. But I'm just curious how that's kind of moving west. Definitely in the digital and cultural arena. So gaming more generally, okay. you know, and, and, and cinematic content as well, music, K-pop and so forth. But, you know, gaming, obviously there's a, a huge innovation that comes from Asia and is adopted elsewhere. And part of the growth of Western tech companies in gaming and content is by acquiring Asian brands and teams and, and integrating them. You could see it culturally with language acquisition and study abroad and the number of entrepreneurs who are now coming over here and um, you know, devoting either VC or other kinds of fund activity to the local markets. Um, you can definitely see a fair number of people leaving big Western tech and wanting to work for the kind of, you know, I don't want to say underdog, but in the startup scene locally and that being perfectly normal. So this manifests itself in quite a few ways.